Good day, teachers. This is Teacher Therese, and today I will be joined by Teacher Erica, Teacher Cleve, and Teacher Marielle in discussing managing learner behavior. Under conduct management falls the concept of teaching appropriate behavior. And given this, in our session, our essential question would be, how can learner behavior be best managed in learning environments? Remember, challenging behaviors are often indicators of what students need. And as a teacher, if you can read the need, you can meet the need. And instead of reacting to a negative behavior, every time it occurs, we can instead proactively react to this and then reduce the occurrence of this behavior. So um, in, in this attempt, we can implement these steps that can be followed loosely to address minor problem behaviors are incorporated into a formal behavior assessment called a functional behavior assessment. First among the steps is we need to identify the problem behavior. This is the building block of this process. Of course, before you implement your solution to a problem, you have to first identify the problem. For example, you have a student, John, and John wouldn't stop disturbing his classmates during class discussion. Um, and you wanted to change this. You wanted to change this kind of behavior. But this is very general, isn't it? We, there are a lot of ways that John may be disturbing her, his classmates. So this way, when you want to change this behavior, you have to be as specific as possible. How do you want to change his way of disturbing his classmates? Maybe you want to say that you want John to stay in his seat during the math lesson. Here are some examples of non-specific behaviors. Um, be more respectful. So there are a lot of ways, for example, your student is not so respectful. There are a lot of ways that he's not respectful, right? He can be, uh, he can be very talkative. He may not be polite. He may be cross-talking when you're talking, those kind of things. So you have to be specific as possible. When you say you wanted your student to be more respectful, maybe you can say that you, you want him to raise his hand before speaking. Another example is stop touching other students. If you wanted to make this more specific, maybe you can say you want a student to not push or hit others. So the point here is that, first of all, you need to identify the problem behavior and to be as specific as possible so that it is more attainable and that you can implement um, the solution better. After we have identified the problem behavior, the next step, second step, is to measure the problem behavior. Why do we measure behavior? First of all, to make your life easier as a teacher. As I've mentioned, if your goals are specific enough, if you have enough information of the problem behavior, you know better how to uh, implement your solutions regarding this. And second is to gain valuable information on when, where, and how often a specific problem behavior occurs. So when you know this, um, this information, you can make inferences from here. Say, for example, you notice that a student is frequently out of her seat during math. Each time the student is out of her seat, you write down the time each day for one week. And the results show that the student is out of her seat most during, most often during independent math practice for an average of five times during the 10 minute work session daily. So what does this tell you? If your student is often out of her seat during dependent math practice, you can infer that maybe this student needs increased supervision and possibly academic help during independent math practice. As I've said, problem behaviors are just students' way of communicating to you and it's your way of knowing what their needs are. Third is to use this information to choose appropriate behavior management strategies. If you know this certain information, you can use this as a blueprint to, to implement your own behavior management strategy. Last, of course, to capture even the smallest signs of progress when attempting to change a student's behavior. With careful monitoring, you can capture even the small steps of progress, such as the decreasing time the student is out of his seat, which can maybe from five, it turned into three. So this should not be overlooked because even the smallest progress leads to bigger changes over time. 
So how do we measure a behavior? We can use a frequency count and a duration recording. When using a frequency count, here we, this, we count the number of times the behavior occurs within a given period of time. So this is applicable for behaviors that have a distinct beginning and ending. So the key point here is how often does the behavior occur in a given period of time? Say, for example, your period of time was during independent math practice, and maybe that is 20 minutes. So you, ha you have to have an e a beginning and an ending, and maybe the beginning was the zero minute, of course, and then the ending was the 20th minute. In that period of time, maybe you want to count how often your student was out of his seat. So in that, in that amount of time, how, how many times your student was out of his seat? So your frequency count, maybe your student was out of his seat 20 times or five times, maybe within 20 minutes. And um, this can be expressed by numbers or by rate. When you want to get the rate, you divide your frequency by the time period. So in this example, you divide 25 by 10 minutes and express in rate that would be 2.5 math problems answered per minute. Here are another examples of frequency counts. Number of times out of seat during math, number of times answered in 10 minutes, number of times students asked for help during independent work time. So the keyword, of course, is how often. Second is duration recording. For behaviors that go on over periods of time, you can use a stopwatch or a timer to measure how long the behavior occurs within a given period of time. So in frequency, you count how often the behavior of cures. In using this duration recording, you count or you measure how long the behavior of cures. For example, the duration can be the total amount of time out of seat during math or the length of time working before a student takes a break. Results of a duration can be a number such as working four minutes of a 10 minute work period, but it can also be a percentage. To get to percentage, you divide the duration by the time period. In this example, that would be 40% of the 10 minute period spent working. So here are another examples of duration recording. We have total amount of time out of seat during math, length of time working before student takes a break, and length of time student worked independently without help. Another way of measuring behavior is the antecedent behavior consequence model. So um, in using this, you need to record what happens before the problem behavior, during the problem behavior, and after the problem behavior. So this model helps us understand why a child is behaving a certain way. So here we will uh, discuss what this ABC model stands for. The A is the antecedents. This tells us about the context for the incident and may help us to identify triggers which set off the particular behavior. So here is the ABC model. The antecedent, of course, is what specific activity or event happened before the behavior. The behavior is what specifically did the child do or say and then the consequence is what happened after or as a result of the child's behavior. So here is an example of an ABC recording. Some antecedent sections are blank because this means that the consequence for the previous behavior also served as an antecedent that triggered the next behavior. So let us see, let us see this example. Uh, the antecedent says, the teacher says, John sit down. And then the behavior is John screams. After this, the teacher says, no screaming, and takes John to time out. So this consequence was also the antecedent that led to John's reaction of screaming because he was put to time out. And then the teacher ignores John, that is the consequence, which also served as the antecedent to the following behavior, which led John to scream louder and to kick the chair. And then the teacher says, no kicking, and so on and so on. So. This is consequential and one action leads to other. So in this ABC model, you get to track what specific antecedents leads to trigger a specific problematic behavior from your student. In that way, you can maybe adjust 
the antecedents or the consequences and then maybe track if there would be any progress in the student's behavior in reaction to these adjustments. Now that we have finally identified the problem behavior and measured the problem behavior, the next step would be to intervene and to implement processes that could solve this problem behaviors. And that would be discussed by Teacher Celine. Thank you so much, Teacher Therese, for your excellent presentation. Now that we already know steps one and two of teaching appropriate behavior, let us move on to step three, to develop a hypothesis to determine the purpose of the behavior. So, from step one, we get to identify the problem behavior. But in this step, we have to scrutinize the problem behavior itself. Like, we really have to examine it thoroughly. Because understanding why the behavior occurs in the first place is one strategy to change it. In short, we have to find the root cause. We need to ponder why does the behavior occurs? How do we know when the behavior is about to happen? Because as teachers who manage the class, we should not lose sight of the fact that a student's behaviors will be repeated when the behavior yields his desired outcome. Let me give an example. A student finds fun in teasing his classmate because he's amused by how easily he gets annoyed. His classmate's reaction causes his frequent taunting. So now, we have to ask ourselves, what is the outcome when he displays this behavior? And there are two examples of outcomes. Number one, does he get something he wants? When the student teases his classmate, did he get something from it? Like I said earlier, the student is amused by his classmate's reactions, so he continues to taunt him in any way that he can. But what does he get from it? We will discuss this later on. The second example of outcome is, does he get to avoid doing something? Maybe the real reason why the student teases his classmate is that he wants to avoid something. From these outcomes, we will now have to wonder why a behavior occurs. A behavior occurs for two main reasons. It's to gain and to avoid something. Pretty simple, right? But it's really not. It's pretty complex because sometimes we do not really know why a student misbehaves. They might have this behavior because... They want to catch your attention, get some stuff they desire, and simply sensory input, or they just want a stimulation. Maybe they're doing the problem behavior because they want to avoid class activities, tasks that they find difficult, and assignments. So earlier, I said that we would tackle what the student gets from teasing his classmate. The first reason a student misbehaves is that he may want to gain something. Maybe he has this goal in mind, like getting attention from the teacher, his peers, or other adults. For example, uh, I know that at some point in our school life, we have a classmate or friend that talks to us while we are busy working on some classwork, right? Uh, some would pull our leg by suddenly tickling or poking us. But for what reason, why would they do these silly acts and pranks we get annoyed at? They simply want our attention. Like, wow, it does feel like a treasured possession when you have someone's attention. Another example of why a behavior occurs. A child wants to play with his favorite toy or have access to gadgets or anything that does not belong to him. So as a result, he would first fully take someone's stuff. When we witness these situations in children, we will just find it normal. Some elders do not even bat an eye because they know that fighting over things is common. But the real reason the student has this behavior is that he wants to get what he wants. Lastly, maybe the student also wants to have a sensory experience. For example, 
they are tapping on desk or body racking, which students are often reprimanded for not sitting still. But the real reason for this is they just want to energize themselves. The situations I explained earlier are some examples of behaviors when a student wants to gain something. But now, how about behaviors when he wants to avoid doing something? What does that student do? Students may want to avoid tasks that exhaust them, such as schoolwork and uncomfortable situations. Because of this, they may intentionally break classroom rules to be sent outside by the teacher. Like, how great is it to do nothing on a fine day, right? But this misbehavior must not be tolerated. As teachers, we have to find ways to stop this problem behavior. But we cannot stop it immediately. So we should focus first in this step. Students may also want to avoid others by not joining them during lunch, recess, and homeroom. If they are doing these things, we should not judge them quickly. Let us keep in mind that students might avoid certain situations or tasks they find unpleasant, even if it's fun, easy, and enjoyable for other students. And what they are doing is called avoidance. Here are the examples of avoidance. Number one, asking to go to the nurse during math period every day. Oh, so faking your illness just avoid a particular subject is a no-no, okay? If you continue to do this, it might result in problem behavior. Number two, talking out during a test to purposely escape by getting sent to the principal's office. It's pretty self-explanatory. There are really some students who want to avoid the exam but would do it in a troublesome manner, right? Number three, Crying or refusing to comply and follow instructions. We often see these situations in young ones. In their desire not to cooperate, they would go to extreme lengths such as crying. These scenarios really happen in the classroom. So teachers, what will we do now? How can we even lessen the problem behavior? So let's proceed to step 4 to know it, which is to choose an appropriate replacement behavior. Think about this. Why should a student employ the appropriate behavior that a teacher recommends rather than the problem behavior? After all, the student's current behavior is beneficial for him. He, get, he gains and avoids something. So this situation poses a challenge because the teacher must carefully select the new behavior to be faster and more efficient than the problem behavior and take note while meeting the same function for the student. In short, it needs to be a win-win situation where the student gets what he wants while not causing problems for everyone. But really, how do we choose an appropriate replacement behavior. Number one, determine the appropriate behaviors displayed by typical children in the same setting. Number two, use the problem behaviors function to seek a more appropriate and efficient behavior that works similarly. Number three, the appropriate behavior might be an alternative or a more appropriate level for the problem behavior. Now, ask yourself, what could the student do instead of performing the problem behavior? Bear in mind that an alternative behavior performs the same function as the problem behavior. It needs to be appropriate for the student's age and is easier or faster to complete. Here are the examples of alternative behaviors. Number one, asking for a toy instead of grabbing it. Number two, Raising hand instead of calling out. Number three, asking for help instead of not completing work. Another question at this point is, would the problem behavior be appropriate if performed at a different level? Because we should remember that some behaviors are only wrong when they are carried out at extreme levels. In reality, what we consider as a standard is the students should generally speak at a moderate level, work at a moderate 
space and interact with others in a moderate amount. From this point, we can clearly see that problem behavior may be an excess when performed too frequently and a behavior deficit when performed seldomly. Here are the examples of appropriate levels. Number one, speaking loudly enough for the teacher to hear. Number two, asking for help only when it's really needed. Number three, completing work at a moderate pace without rushing or taking too much time to complete. Okay, did you learn something from steps three and four? I really hope you learned something from this presentation. And don't worry because you will know more as we proceed to teacher Marielle where she will explain how to identify the current stage of learning and determine the level of support. So that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Teacher Sabine. I am Teacher Marielle and we'll now go on to the next step. The fifth step is to identify the current stage of learning. Before we can teach a replacement behavior, we must first determine where it fits in the student's skill repertoire. Thinking back to common thoughts about behavior, a student may not display acceptable behavior if they don't know how, if they know how in some situations but not others, or if they lack motivation. Therefore, as educators, we must always remember that teaching behavior is just like teaching an academic skill. It means that we should have a strategic plan in place to develop classroom boundaries that keep our students safe while also allowing for optimum learning. So here's an example. If a student isn't working on their addition sheet during math class, it's possible that they don't know how to do addition, they need assistance with particular processes, or they just don't want to do the sheet. So the teacher may teach addition, offer help, or offer an incentive, which all depends on the skill level of that particular student. Teachers will always, always encounter this kind of situation. We must always consider any of these actions. So ask yourself, is any part of this behavior currently in the repertoire? So here are some examples of things to think about. Can they demonstrate part of this skill? Can they demonstrate this skill with help? Can they demonstrate this skill anywhere else? After identifying the skill level in a student's repertoire, it will now lead us to consider the stages of learning. Students master all skills, both academic and behavioral, through these stages. So what are the stages of learning? Achievement is greatest where there is a good match between the instructional strategies and the student's current stage of learning for that particular content. So here are the four basic stages of learning. First stage is acquisition. This includes brand new skills, such as a kindergarten student being taught for the first time to raise their hand to be called upon by the teacher. This is where the student has begun to learn how to complete the target skill correctly but is not yet accurate or fluent in the skill. The goal in this phase is to improve accuracy. Second stage is fluency which means previously taught skills that the students need to perform more efficiently such as a student who still counts on their fingers when doing addition. This is where the student is able to complete the target skill accurately but works slowly. The goal of this phase is to increase the student's speed of responding. Next stage is maintenance. This is previously taught skills that the student can routinely perform under similar circumstances. For example, the student independently reads several books in the same reading level. The student retains mastery levels of performance attained when direct instruction was in effect. Students will need continued practice and direct through infrequent intervention, particularly if they had difficulty mastering the skill in the first place. This is where both accuracy and proficiency remain at high levels. The goal of instruction is retention of knowledge, skill, or behavior. Then finally, for the last stage, it's generalization. This is previously taught skills that the student can perform in a variety of circumstances. Here we have strategies for every stage of learning. Once again, the first stage is acquisition. During this stage, the teacher should introduce the skill using examples, provide ample practices opportunities, and correct errors immediately. Some more strategies are, teacher actively demonstrate target skills, use a think aloud strategy, especially for thinking skills that are otherwise covert, student has models of correct performance to consult as needed, example, correctly completed math problems on board. Student gets feedback about correct performance and student receives praise, encouragement for effort. 
When a student can perform the skill correctly with support on most opportunities, then they are ready to move to the next stage. And that is... Fluency is using the selected skill faster. Some strategies are teacher structures learning activities to give student opportunity for active responding. Student has frequent opportunities to drill and practice. Students get feedback on fluency and accuracy of performance in student received phrases. Encouragement for increased fluency. During this stage, the teacher should provide practice opportunities while gradually decreasing assistance so the student can possibly perform the skill independently on most opportunities and can move to the next stage. During the maintenance stage, the teacher should provide practice opportunities and monitor the student to affirm that they can perform the skill independently as time passes by, giving encouragement, praise, and reinforces for using skills in new settings and situations are some additional strategies. If a student confuses target skill with similar skill, the student is given practice items that force or that force him or her to correctly discriminate between similar skills. The teacher works with parents to identify tasks that the student can do outside of school to practice target skill. And the student receives periodic opportunities to review and practice target skill. When the student consistently performs the skill over time, they may now proceed to the final stage. The final stage is generalization. During this stage, the teacher should provide opportunities for the student to practice the skill with different people, different materials, or in different locations. So when the student can independently perform the skill in various situations, then the student has mastered the skill. Some strategies are the teacher helps students articulate the big ideas or core elements of the target skill with modest modifications in new situations and settings with encouragement, corrective feedback, praise, and other enforcers. They encourage the student to set his or her own goals for adapting the skill to new and difficult situations. To sum it up, the acquisition stage is where the teacher teaches with examples and correct errors. The fluency stage is to decrease prompts and assistance. Maintenance is for the student to practice the skill independently. And the last stage is generalization, where a student performs practice skills in various situations. We are now on the sixth step. Determine the level of support. Use the identified stage of learning that we have discussed earlier to determine the level of support needed to demonstrate the new behavior. This time, ask yourself, what support does the student need to demonstrate this certain skill? Here are some examples of supports that teachers can use. Do they need help? Do they need encouragement? Are the students doing the skill correctly? There are three types of support. Prompts, error correction, and reinforcement. For skill acquisition, use most of these prompts. For example, during handwriting, begin by having a student trace the letters, and as the student progresses, have them write the letters instead of just tracing them. Another type of prompt is the least to most prompts for fluency and maintenance skills. For example, during reading, allow the student first to try to sound out a word and then offer help if they become stuck. The following type of assistance is error correction. This can be utilized at any point in the process anytime a student commits a mistake. The teacher should pause the lecture, go over the skill quickly, and then provide further practice opportunities. The final sort of support is reinforcement. This can also be utilized at any level to enhance students' motivation to complete tasks or behave appropriately. Teachers can help their students learn by rewarding them with praise, privileges, or small rewards. To summarize the types of support, prompts have two types, most to least when teaching new skills and least to most for strengthening existing skills. These are visual supports. Next, error correction. Whenever a student commits an error, stop the lesson, they teach it, and then do additional practice. Lastly, reinforcement, where teachers praise frequently when teaching new skills, praise intermittently when strengthening existing skills, and use tangible such as tokens or stickers, which can be exchanged for a prize. And that's it! The final two steps will now be discussed by Teacher Cleave. Thank you, Teacher Marielle. Again, I'm Teacher Cleave, and we'll be moving on to the last two of the eight systematic steps to promote behavior changes in students. After identifying the level of support the students need, it is time to track their new behavior. 
As students practice a replacement behavior, they move through the stages of learning. First, the student becomes more fluent in the behavior. Next, the student can now reliably demonstrate the behavior. And then, they begin to demonstrate the behavior in new environments. Though sometimes progress can be noticed through casual observation, there are also times when it is not noticeable, and that's when we can use these measurement tools to both define and track the behavior of the students. We might also want to ask ourselves, how do I know when the student is improving? Here are some examples of improvement in the student's behavior. So first, when a student can perform a skill without help, now that student has completed the acquisition stage of the new behavior, and next, performing a skill faster, the student is increasing his or her fluency of the new behavior. And then third, when the student can perform a skill in different activities or increasing the generalization. Now the question is, in what ways can we track the new behavior? So behavioral or academic skills can be tracked using a graph to show progress over time. Graphs are very helpful in showing progress visually and can be easily shared with other teachers and parents to demonstrate change in the behavior of the students over time. So when graphing desired behaviors, uh, teachers should look for an increase in the frequency or duration of the behavior over time. So for example, uh, for a student who does not ask for help, uh, or guidance raising his hand two times per class is an improvement over raising his hand once or not at all in other classes. Second, when graphing undesired behaviors, uh, teachers should look for a decrease in the frequency or duration of the behavior uh, over time. So for example, uh, there are students who work slowly and for them to complete the task in just about 20 minutes, you know, uh, over completing the similar task in 30 minutes is already a sign of improvement. And we can notice a decrease in the duration of the behavior in that uh, example. Next, when we're graphing erratic and inconsistent behaviors, a graph that becomes more stable over time shows that the replacement behavior may be stabilizing the problem behavior. So for example, a student who consistently asks for help two to three times during class is an improvement over asking more than 10 times in some class periods and then none at all in other class periods. And let us remember that graphs are our friend when it comes to tracking the behavior of the students. Now that we know how to track their behavior, here are a few other ways on how we can improve the student's behavior. So first is creating a contingency contract. So this is a behavior change system that offers a way for the teacher or parent to target a student's behavior and involving the student to correct their own behavior. This kind of contract specifies the relationship between the completion of a specified behavior and access to a specific reinforcer. So this type of student contract includes and describes the tasks, the reward, and more importantly, a record of the progress. Moreover, utilizing this kind of contracting uh, provides an individualized approach for a specific student or can be made with the entire class to work towards positive behaviors in the classroom. So contingency contracts are widely used in classroom, home, and even in clinical settings. Another way is the well-known token economy. So this is a behavior change system that consists of first, a list of target behaviors to be reinforced, Next, incent incent <clears throat> Next, incentives such as tokens or points that the students receive for producing the, tar the targeted behaviors. And lastly, 
a menu of items or activities that students can exchange for the tokens or points that they earned. So a common example that many teachers use is a treasure box in which students can draw or select prizes such as stickers, special pencils, small toys, or other school supplies. And schools often have a school store in which students can turn in their tokens or tickets or points for school supplies or the other age appropriate items. So they, uh, the reward that they get, for example, they have the token, they get to exchange it in the store for, uh, let's say, candy or a school supply. And then you can also create your own version of token economy as long as you consider and give it careful thought or a thorough plan on how to begin, implement, maintain, evaluate, and remove such behavior uh, change systems. So third is a group contingency plan. So this utilizes a common consequence that is contingent upon the behavior of an individual member of a group, a part of the group, or everyone in the group. So for, for example, when working in a group, the teacher can have all the group members perform on a certain task. So let's say a group project, and uh, this is to earn reward for the entire group. Um, let's say uh, they can have free time wherein they, ca they can play or uh, give them tangible rewards. So when we already notice an improvement in the student's behavior, that's when we can slowly decrease or minimize our guidance. And that is our eighth and last step, which is fade assistance. <clears throat> Another purpose of tracking the new behavior is to know when to decrease the support. And as a student moves through the stages of learning, he or she will uh, need less assistance to demonstrate the replacement behavior and de decreasing the assistance uh, moves the student towards the ultimate goal of being able to perform the replacement behavior independently in different situations. Again, you might want to ask yourself, how can I increase the independence of the student by decreasing the level of support? So to start with, here are examples of increased independence. So first, so first, uh, when students need help, so first, when students need less help or assistance to demonstrate the skill, meaning that they can do most of the activity on their own. And next, we have when students need uh, less reinforcement to demonstrate a skill. So this is when you don't have to uh, give them anything in return just so that they can start working out on a task, but they start doing it because they want to or they're willing to do so, and they're not waiting for anything in return after they have completed the task. Moving on, we have two ways in decreasing the level of support. So first, we have decreased the level of prompts, and second is fade reinforcement. So let's go to the first one. So first, we have decreased the level of prompts. So to alter prompts, use a visual rather than verbal prompts, because visual prompts can be used independent of the teacher. So we can flash the prompt in the screen where everyone can see it or read it so that you don't have to say it or read it out loud to them. And providing minimal guidance or prompting will help the students to perform their replacement behavior on their own. Another way to decrease the level of support is to fade reinforcement. And for us to do that, uh, we can increase the number of activities or amount of time to be completed before delivering reinforcement. So for instance, instead of giving a reward right after they finish one task, uh, you can give it 
right after they finish three or more tasks. And teachers can also use the token economy to delay rewards. Fate assistance doesn't mean that we have to remove our guidance completely. Rather, it means that we should provide our students with the necessary help that they need so that they can have more confidence in themselves whenever they experience or try new things. There we have it, the eight systematic steps to promote behavior changes in students. And before we part ways, let me share with you an important reminder that change doesn't happen in the blink of an eye. It takes a lot of process, but planning is the key to achieve our goal. And we hope that this discussion has been beneficial to you and that you can apply these steps and strategies to your students as well and for you to achieve your desired outcomes. So stay safe and thank you for tuning in.